Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a week of Linux news for the 30th of July of 2017. Say, what are the valid characters allowed in a DNS lookup? A lookup for an internet address. Oh, it appears to be 253 ASCII characters long, alphanumeric, with the minus sign or dash allowed. But it is a bit debatable about the underscore character. Hmm, okay. Not too complicated. So what does system D think is allowed? From the register? DNS lib underscore bug bites everyone's favourite init tool, blanks Netflix. Repeat after me, underscore is allowed in domain names. A few penguinistas spent a weekend working out why they can't get through to Netflix from their favourite Linux machines, because when they tried, their DNS lookups failed. The system D resolver couldn't look up Netflix servers. According to reports in the detailed bug report, it stated, the internet address IPv6 underscore one and all the rest of that stuff on Netflix should resolve to those two IP addresses, 37.77 and the rest, or that long IPv6, when in reality that wasn't happening, so Netflix couldn't be reached on his box. His speculation that libidn2, which adds internationalised domain names support to the resolver, was at fault. It turned out to be accurate. Rebuilding systemd without that library cleared the problem. So the library was stripping underscores from domain names, and that caused everything relying on the resolver to fail. This problem affects systemd version 234. So if you're affected by the DNS problem, rebuild systemd without libidn2, that assumes you're using something like gen2, or you can stop using systemd as your resolver. Now I was starting to think whether this was just a bug or could be a vulnerability. So it depends what's happening to this underscore character. If it's being stripped out, replaced with nothing, then in theory you're actually looking up completely the wrong website address. And if there was a malicious website at that, say, IPv6 one hyphen CXL blah blah blah, then you could be served up a completely malicious file. Although it's still not quite as straightforward as just being given a malicious file, you still have to have some method of it being executed. If it's a vulnerability, I would say it's a very low, very, very low risk vulnerability. But because systemd have made too many mistakes now recently, a lot of eyes are upon them, and this is not helping the situation. Another article from the register. Celebrations are in order! Adobe will kill off Flash by 2020! <laughs> On the sub-headline from the register. Buggy multimedia nightmare won't see President Zuckerberg's inauguration. Oh. God, I hope not. <laughs> Adobe has officially set a kill date for its beleaguered Flash. So they plan to end support in 2020. It means no more updates for Flash Player, and after that date, and the end of support on many browsers, including Chrome Internet Explorer and Edge. Firefox also says it will shut off Flash games by the end of 2020, and is asking developers to change their Facebook games to a different format. The announcement will be welcome news for security professionals and administrators, as it is one less attack vector to worry about. The notoriously insecure Flash plugin has emerged in recent years as a favourite target for automated exploit kits due to its prevalence and large number of serious flaws lingering in the code. In the meantime, however, it will be at least another three years of dutifully patching Flash Player every month and advising users to either disable or at least make Flash content click to play in their browser settings. So what I think will happen now is the number of attacks against Flash will decrease, and a lot of the attacks will be held back in reserve until 2020, but at which point most users will still have Flash Player on their system with all these vulnerabilities on it, and the attacks will just be let loose knowing that Adobe will never patch them. Yes, I think it's maybe good news for the moment, but with worse news yet to come. KDE Plasma have released a vision statement. So Plasma is a cross-device work environment by the KDE community, where the trust is put on the user's capacity to define her own workflow and preferences. Plasma is simple by default, a clean work area for real-world usage, which intends to stay out of your way. Plasma is powerful when needed, enabling the user to create a powerful workflow that makes her more effective to complete her tasks. Well, I know my place. I'm out of here. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> I think um, it's probably written by someone whose first language is not English. And I don't think they mean to be sexist by the statement saying her or him, or instead of being gender neutral. Plasma never dictates the user's needs. It only strives to solve them. 
Plasma never defines what the user is allowed to do, it only ensures that they can. Our motivation is to enable actual work to happen across devices, across different platforms, using any application needed. We build to be durable. We create to be usable. We design to be elegant. That's some very nice wording there. So cross device. This was something I thought about before with Canonical ending work on Unity, that it meant that KD Plasma was probably the next best cross-platform desktop for Linux. And sure enough, this is what they're striving towards. Well, even if it doesn't make too much of an impact on mobile, it will at least have this uh, ability to work in different screen sizes. So you could say at least between 1080 and 4K displays. Uh, I'm just gonna skip ahead on the next one, but simple by default. Now this is uh, something I thought perhaps, how can you say that given the number of settings in KD Plasma? But yeah, actually thinking about it, the basic interface you're presented with Plasma is perfectly usable and you need not make any changes to it. But if you want to, there is actually quite a plethora of settings you can adjust. So we don't want to overwhelm the user, but to present a serene, friendly environment. Yeah, it's friendly initially until you go delving into the background. Well, it sounds some very nice wording. And I think from what I've seen so far, they are certainly keeping to this vision and striving to improve upon what they have. From Torrent Freak, Cody security risk emerges after TV add-ons shut down. Three domains previously operated by defunct Cody add-on site TV add-ons have been transferred to a law firm in Canada. With no explanation forthcoming, the security implications cannot be ignored. So a third party in control of these domains could potentially do whatever they wanted to a vulnerable former TV add-ons users. So until recently, tvaddons.ag was the leading repository for these add-ons. During March, the platform had 40 million unique users. Everything was going well until news broke last month that the people behind TV add-ons were being sued in a federal court in Texas, shortly after the site went dark and hasn't been back since. This was initially a nuisance to the millions of Kodi devices that relied on TV add-ons for their add-ons and updates. With the site gone, none were forthcoming. However, the scene recovered relatively quickly, and for users who know what they're doing, add-ons are now available from elsewhere. TV add-ons domains are now being run by a law firm which refuses to answer questions, but has the power to do whatever it likes with them, within the law of course. Currently the domains are lying dormant and aren't doing anything nefarious. But if that position changes, millions of people have absolutely no idea that anything is wrong. So if you have the TV add-ons repository on your Kodi device, you could receive any kind of updates that are served, be it whether they're actually malicious or not. And the theory is your Kodi device could be made to do absolutely anything. So the advice is to uninstall the add-on. We've hit the alpha 2 point of release on Ubuntu 17.10 Artful Aardvark, although Ubuntu itself is not participating in the alpha 2, but some of the derivatives are. So Kubuntu, anything particular much here? So not really, we have KDE Plasma 5.10, and that's probably going to be 5.10.4, KDE Application 16.12.3. And in terms of known problems, the back forward button in the Kubuntu slideshow is broken. Huh. How do you break that? <laughs> in the installer, I assume they're talking about. And blank screen after running OEM config. Still, that's what you get for it being an alpha at the moment. Ubuntu Mate. <laughs> oh, very cheeky of them. Welcome Unity 7 refugees. This is the Ubuntu flavour you've been searching for. We're not happy, proud, pleased or ambivalent to announce this alpha. No, not us. This is our most super alpha ever. And we're ecstatic to present this fine release for your distro delection. Ubuntu 1710 is brimming with new toys to play with. Yeah, very nice, Martin. Very nice. So what has changed? Well, panel layout. And I think we're looking more at the Mutiny interface because that's the one that best replicates the Unity 7 interface. So there's a few screenshots there. <laughs> looking good. Yes, you have a desktop switcher in Ubuntu Mato, if you haven't realized. So the global menu is now much improved and available via the contemporary cappuccino and mutiny layouts, which can be activated by the Mate tweak. And it's fully functional with GTK, Qt, LibreOffice, Firefox, Chrome, and other applications. Well, that's the first desktop to support those different types because GNOME doesn't support Qt and KD doesn't support GTK. The heads up display, Oh, that's something I showed a bit of last week. Looks like that's working properly now. 
and a few other things, so I'll tell you what, I think that's the release I'm most excited about. Ubuntu Budgie. Well, this has had a plethora of changes. The Alpha 2 highlights. I might not go into this one too much because my expertise is not particularly good on Budgie, and I know they've been moving towards the Qt base, but whether they've actually done that for this release or not, I'm not entirely sure. Possibly not. Looking at some notes there, it says Nautilus 3.24 support, which, yeah, in the GNOME applications, that wouldn't do particularly good if you had a Qt base. So I'm going to say odds are it's still GTK based. And Lubuntu, there's not particularly much here. In fact, yeah, really nothing much at all. I'm surprised they're not talking about Lubuntu Next, which will be using the LXQt desktop. This is still talking about Lubuntu LXDE. I didn't think they were doing anything much at all with LXDE, but apparently there are a couple of things that are broken. And now for this week's stupid news, and it goes to the government of Sweden. So from Privacy News Online, Sweden's Transport Authority moved all of its data to the cloud, apparently unaware there is no cloud, only someone else's computer. In doing so, it exposed and leaked every conceivable top secret database, fighter pilots, SEAL team operators, police suspects, people under witness relocation, names, photos and home addresses. The list is just getting started. The responsible director has been found guilty in criminal court of the whole affair and been sentenced to the harshest sentence ever given in the Swedish government. She was docked half a month's paycheck. Wow, ooh, that will teach her. That will really teach her there. <sighs> Many governments have had partial leaks in terms of method or relations, but this is the first time I'm aware that the full treasure chest of every single top secret governmental individual with photo name, home addresses has been leaked. It goes to show, again, that governments can't keep their most secret data under wraps. So any governmental assurances that your data is safe have about as much value as a truckload of dead rats in a tampon factory. <laughs> okay, <laughs> interesting way of wording it. It started out with a very speedy trial where Director General in Sweden was fined half the month's pay. Given how much the establishment has got each other's backs, this sentence was roughly equivalent to life in prison for a common person on the street, meaning that they must have done something really awful to get not just a guilty verdict, but actually be fined half a month's salary. And that was a week of Linux news. Thanks for watching, I'll see you all later.